This is one of the most famous stories in the entire world where Satan gets hurled down to earth like lightning from heaven. And we get a glimpse of the story in Revelation 12, 9, but that isn't actually the full story because there is a much more complete version left by the ancient Egyptians. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a tale about good versus evil. This was the great war in heaven. I mean, you really have to understand how much majesty was given unto Adam. From the very start, humanity was God's favorite creation. I mean, after all, we were given an entire planet to rule over. You see, being created in the image of God, our very purpose was to rule over the earth like God does in heaven. See, this glorious status was only reserved for humans. So when the prince of the lower order of angels sees this, he gets pissed. One of heaven's mightiest angels was Lucifer. He was this most magnificent being made of fire and spirit. In fact, there's reason to believe that Lucifer was one of the very first angels ever created. After all, he used to be a bright and morning star. But you probably already knew about this. However, something that isn't really talked about is just how much authority this guy actually had. You see, Lucifer, according to this Egyptian legend, was the prince of the lower order of the angels. They actually describe him to be this ruler over his own division, making him some kind of general with proper authority and power. So when God created Adam and gave him dominion over the entire earth, Lucifer, who thought of himself very highly, would get entirely filled with jealousy. Adam, on the other hand, was just made from dust. Although at the very start he was shining brilliantly with light, Adam would only be made from the ground of the earth. He wasn't a magnificent being of fire like the angels. But Adam was still created to be a reflection of God himself. God loved Adam so much that he gave him the entire world and everything in it. Adam was to rule over all life and all life was to serve Adam. You see, Lucifer must have already been jealous. He led his army, he was a prince, he was the most beautiful of all, but Lucifer was never given dominion over a world. So when God announces that all angels have to serve Adam, Lucifer officially has enough. Addressing his legions, he finally proclaims, why should we serve this creature made of dust? So inspired by raging jealousy, one third of the angels join Lucifer. You see, starting from here, a revolution had begun. Lucifer would now declare independence from God. Lucifer had declared war on the Almighty himself. I mean, the level of arrogance is absolutely stupendous to me. At this point, Lucifer really thinks he can defeat his creator. The pride, the hatred, had absolutely blinded him to the fact that this was suicide. But there is no rest for the wicked. Lucifer, this highly esteemed chief cherub, was now utterly consumed with rebellion. So the next day, six million military angels would show up to Lucifer's doorstep. These were commanded by the Archangel Michael and consisted of 120,000 horsemen, 600,000 shield bearers, 700,000 mail clad horsemen in chariots of fire, 700,000 torch bearers, 800,000 angels with daggers of fire, 1 million slingers, 500,000 bearers of axes of fire, 300,000 bearers of fiery crosses, and 400,000 bearers of lamps. You see, these angels had come to evict Lucifer from his heavenly home. So as Lucifer sees Michael and his army approaching, the very last chances to turn back would slip away forever. They had now officially become Satan, the enemy to God. So with the fate of Lucifer sealed, the angels charge at each other with a roaring battle cry. And this cosmic clash between good and evil takes place. And at this point, there was no more turning back. Now, according to this Egyptian legend, Lucifer was this huge being. He was so huge that during this war, every single time Michael and his army would try to get close to him, Lucifer would simply charge them back, which would disperse Michael's army. His sheer stature was enough to pummel through Michael's defensive lines, and it was pretty clear that Lucifer was winning. But that was until God decides to intervene. You see, now as Michael and his angels are literally running away from Satan, God grants his angels this cross of light. 
Not much is known about this cross. But according to this ancient Egyptian legend, this cross bore the legend of in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And when they attacked Satan under this cross, Lucifer and all of his angels would instantly become faint. This is what allowed Michael to just swoop in and cast them out in an instant. You see, this cross is what ultimately made Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, what is this cross of light? Well, unfortunately, there is a general lack of information about this topic, but I think it's possible to decipher its meaning. Well, if you rewind in the story, it actually tells us that it bore the legend of in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, that alone should tell us that whatever this cross was used for, it would be backed by the Godhead in unison. It would be backed by the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that when God puts his name on something, that same thing will be victorious every single time. So, of course, take this with a grain of salt. But I think this cross of light symbolizes God's favor. It was some kind of metaphor that tuned in Michael and his angels into God's unstoppable power. And it was this power that cast down Satan like lightning from heaven. Now, it is important to note that this story does in fact have some errors in it. Like the fact that in this legend, Satan gets cast down to hell. But the truth is, Satan is very much still here on earth, still roaming, still destroying. But it is still very interesting how the Egyptians originally told this legend. Because the prototype to the story actually involved Egyptian gods like Set and Ra. In the oldest form of the story, Set, the devil, rebels against the god of heaven and gets utterly destroyed. In another form, Set makes war on Horus, the son of Osiris, and then on Osiris himself. You see, these stories were actually borrowed from hieroglyphics and then later Christianized. But don't disregard the story just yet. You see, in the Book of Enoch, we learn about this secondary group of angels that come down from heaven before the flood. They, just like Lucifer, wanted to be worshipped and adored. So after these fallen angels come down from heaven, they would end up posing as false gods that would clutter the earth in those days. You see, a lot of these fallen angels are generally associated with these Egyptian gods, like Ra and Osiris. There is a distinct possibility that the Egyptian gods in this story are actually Lucifer and his angels from a very long time ago. I wonder how much truth there is to this story. Now, in the end, I realized that the beauty of this story doesn't lie in the historical or biblical accuracy, but rather in the lessons they teach. This story has endured through the ages for a reason, and I think that reason is the unwavering fact that no one on earth and nobody in heaven can ever surpass the boundless strength of the Almighty God. Now, concluding this video, I do want to say this is not biblically canon. None of this stuff is found in the Bible, so none of this stuff should be treated as scripture. These are stories that give us a picture of what potentially was going on a very long time ago. It is the little specks of truth that are scattered within these stories that give us this picture of this strange world of angels and demons. Now, this truly is one of the greatest stories ever told. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the great war in heaven.